Good day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley. Today, we are going to be talking about autistic sensory support and environmental adjustments for autistic children and adults. I'm going to be talking on the adult side of things. My very lovely guest, Natasha from I Want to Tell You Books on Instagram is going to be talking about the more um, children side of things. We're going to be looking at adjustments in terms of the workplace, the school, um, the home. So if you're looking to kind of understand your sensory profile a bit more, maybe put some things in place to help manage your sensory environment, whether it's home, whether it's out and about, this is the episode for you. Before we get started, I just want to point out the fact that, yes, my camera angle has changed. <laughs> I, um, I've i got quite a few comments about people who have come up to me in person and sort of remarked that they feel like I'm a very small person. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm about 6'3", which is quite off-putting to a lot of people who think I'm kind of small. I think it's because of the angle that I have the, the webcam at. So now I've got kind of this webcam tripod set up, um, hoping that it, it kind of looks a bit better on YouTube. Yeah, I'm coming out of my couple of weeks long burnout, uh, feeling refreshed after a week of trying not to do as much, perhaps taking a break from the podcast. Realized that I didn't put one out last week, so I apologize for that. I tried to notify people both on YouTube and on Instagram. So if you're just listening to the podcast, um, I realized that you might not have had that update. But anyway, I'm going to introduce our guest uh, on the 40 OT podcast today, Natasha, who is a Instagrammer uh, from uh, I Want to Tell You Books, and they do they're a neurodiversity affirming mom, mom parent, of course. <laughs> they focus on uh, doctors, teachers, and parents, shifting them from a deficit based model to a more strength-based approach and neurodiversity approach um, in the home, which is really, really great, sort of combining those adult autism advocacy circles with the parenting stuff, always really great, awesome stuff. Uh, they focus on things uh, like self-advocacy, self-regulation, and lots of other amazing, cool stuff. So, um, Natasha, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me. This is exciting. I've been binging your podcast. <laughs> oh, you have? <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> what what what's what's been your your favorite at the moment? Um, I've been listening to all the women, and I shared it with my sister, who's autistic and ADHD, and she is loving it as well. Uh, it's so nice to have um, a, a focused podcast on the autistic experience. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I actually was, I was looking through the rankings of my podcast recently. Um, I don't know if I talked about this in the last episode because I recorded it like a week or so ago, but I'm pretty sure that this is the world's top autism podcast as far as I know. That's incredible. Um, well, <laughs> it's a bit mad. Like, like, um, but yeah, that's, I mean, you should be proud of yourself. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm kind of tentative around it because it's it's quite hard to gauge that kind of thing. Um, because there's like different categories of podcasts and stuff, but in terms of like health and wellness section of autism, um, as far as I know, that's the the top one, and it's in the I think broken into about the top two percent of all podcasts so far. So we're doing well. well and done. I just wanted to point that out and just say thank you to everyone who is continually listening to uh, the podcast and supporting my work. It's yeah, I really enjoyed really it. Great. Oh, thank you. Well, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about sort of um, how you started your your Instagram stuff and why you got into this this space? Um, I wasn't looking to be a content creator. I it actually was a struggle for quite a while um, figuring out my place and what to share how to share it and that learning curve. And I think uh, the neurodivergent tendency to want to be perfect at it and not 
yeah. um, present anything that was less than your best. Uh, that was mm-hmm. hard for me. And I am a private person as well. Um, I didn't want to be sharing my life and certainly not my children's lives on social media for anybody sure. to um, have their eyes on it. So there, there's definitely been a learning curve of protecting their privacy and mm-hmm. not sharing uh, anything that they wouldn't want to be shared and look back on, you know, in 10 years. Um, that's a whole, <laughs> whole topic in itself. Uh, yeah, but I think it's, it's, it's definitely something that I've seen about a lot and it seems to be quite a, a topic, something that kind of drives a pretty hard knife through the connection between the (laughs) autism parenting and artistic adult worlds. Yeah. And finding a way to educate others uh, without compromising your integrity, that is a hard thing with social media. But it is important to find a platform to, um, promote safe practices. Um, my, both my kids are neurodivergent. My son Mm -hmm. is autistic and my daughter is ADHD. And, um, it came down to learning a lot myself and unlearning a lot. And I come from a neurodiverse family. So I was raised, uh, in (laughs) the time before, um, neurodiversity affirming practices. And I saw the results. I saw how it affected mental health and yeah. I refused to repeat that cycle. So I took it upon myself to, um, learn from autistic adults and, uh, find ways to support my son and mm-hmm. respect his needs. And then, um, learned about our environment and how it was affecting him. And I saw that there were a lot of parents who hadn't accessed that volume of information from autistic adults. And so kind of finding a way to bridge the autistic experience into um, homes where Mm -hmm. parents are struggling and uh, wanting their autistic children to be respected and supported um, and finding a way to present the information um, in a way that would be absorbed by parents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Cause there's, there's, I think the, the issue with a lot of autism content is it's very, it's very niche down and kind of a bit, um, jargony for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, you start talking about neurodivergent stims and sensory joy. Like most people would be like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, definitely. You know, but, really breaking down um, those definitions that it is a different language. And uh, I think it's important that we're teaching our children about the language as well. It's, you know, just, it's not taboo. Uh, disability, disabled is not a bad word. Sure. Um, really making it a, uh, just a transparent conversation in the home and presenting it to, to other families so that they can kind of um, feel supported as well. Yeah, I I really, I mean, I, I said this before, but I really like, you know, the idea of tying communities together because um, my, my view is, is that if we can, all, if we can all sort of band together and come up with like things that, are, that each of these groups agree with and things that they can kind of run with and even, even going so, you know, minuscule as language use, um, language use can be like, a massive barrier for a lot of parents absolutely um a lot of people trying even autistic people trying to get into the the autism communities and sort of share their stories and ask questions um i think that when when you're within the adult autistic community specifically on instagram it's um the language is is very tightly sort of monitored and controlled by a lot of people um which, you know, it's understandable, but I think sometimes it can kind of, it can cause people to be kind of isolated from yeah. from entering those spaces and sort of working with, um, you know, parents and researchers and organizations and stuff. 
So I I I just all in all think I think it's really it's a positive thing to do. I'm just wondering, like, um, have you had any difficulties, like, because of that crossover between those two worlds? Um, at the beginning, I did. I had to uh, adjust my approach, and and a lot of it is um, being humble to the feedback. Uh, you're receiving. Sure. And I started on this journey. Um, and my son is almost 10. And it started off with a lot of medical intervention. Uh, he has some mm-hmm. physical disabilities, uh, in addition to neurological. So a lot of the focus was on that. And uh, we went through a lot of therapies that were not neurodiversity affirming. And sure. I think back to that experience and, you know, even something like occupational therapy, which is Mm -hmm. a wonderful resource, but thinking back to what he experienced as a toddler uh, with like exposure therapy. And we now know that that is um, not a safe practice for autistic people. Uh, It doesn't get them used to it. It just makes them mask their pain. So, um, there was a lot of learning and I think that that's what's uh, hard for parents with a newly diagnosed autistic child is so many doctors and therapists are not up to date on um, research. So many. <laughs> so, most of them, even, right? Even the specialists, <laughs> like, like yes, autism specialists. They like, are so crazy. out of date. And yeah. um, so it, it there definitely needs to be some way of presenting this information to parents with newly diagnosed, diagnosed kids, um, mm-hmm. that the doctors maybe are not the, <laughs> the gold standard of research. Um, yeah. and maybe yeah. the, what the feedback that they're giving you or the therapies that they're encouraging you to seek, um, may not be the best, uh, resources for that information. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I, there is a learning curve for parents of going from that point to uh, listening to autistic adults. And, um, and it it does take a lot of humility on the parents part (laughs) to um, realize that maybe they were hurting their kids along the way. And how do I undo that trauma? Uh, Yeah. And I think, I think there's, there can, there can be, you know, as with anything in life, when, you know, I I never, I'm I'm a person. I never jump to the assumption that someone's doing stuff maliciously or just wanting to. You know, but if they if they've been through these kind of therapy routes and it's been, um, taught, you know, they've been encouraged to by doctors and and medical professionals. I don't like. I see it more as an issue with the system rather than the person. Yes. I don't like immediately jump and say like oh this is horrible get this this out there i don't want we don't want to talk to you shut the conversation down that kind of thing um and you know it can go so far as even like people using different types of language or labels that most people that are not are not happy with you know for me it's not something that i kind of focus in on too much it's it's you know trying to in be open and warm to other people wanting to learn um yeah and i think that's where a lot of people can get they can kind of swing the other way i mean th- there's a specific um situation where i was talking to um an, in- an instagrammer sort of public figure person called uh, the autism cafe and yep, she was she was talking about um her experiences being being quite heavily bullied by the autistic community and um it's uh, it's interesting i mean she she works for autism speaks um which is another kind of point of <laughs> difficulty for a lot of autis- autistic yeah. adults and um, she's autistic which, herself right exactly uh but i f- i feel like you know even even though i've i've taken stances against those kind of organizations and sort of the practices and stuff i'm still i'm still very you know open and compassionate and i I care about her and i i know that it's it's a very hard line to walk but i feel like the 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 fire and the 
controversy and the the sort of attacks and the bullying it does more to shut people down than to actually produce any anything productive yeah um and i feel like that's kind of pushed her in it in a way that's kind of c- counter to that and it, yeah. and it you know you see you see a p- the posts and stuff and you have you have parents and you have a lot of people following her um, yeah, but there is always that there is always that kind of issue around um other autistic adults but it's 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 a complex thing i mean i'm sure we could talk about that for yeah for ages i'm just really happy that it's similar to like the shift from medical model of disability to the social model of disability Mm. i you don't know what you don't know and once you do you need to do better so the you know i think the general public doesn't realize that there is a difference between medical model and social model. But Mm -hmm. um, for me, I I was watching my son um, in being tortured by life and I had to fix that. I would not him fix the environment and fix Mm -hmm. um, how he was being treated. And I, I recognized his, responses to people around him. And then I started looking for the patterns of like, why is he in distress and how, when, especially when he was non-speaking um, mm-hmm. and he was, he was uh, learning his AAC device, uh, finding ways to communicate with him um, to figure out how can I support him? He's going to have a visitor right now. <laughs> yeah. We have a visitor. <laughs> Hi. We are just going outside. Okay, put socks on. Have fun. He was letting me know he's going outside <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> with okay. with his um, caregiver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, um, I've, I, I, I. This is why I kind of I really appreciate kind of the work that you're doing because I, I, I feel like there's a missed opportunity for for really having more backing towards improving life quality for autistic people when we have as many people on board with the same thing and the same kind of rhetoric and the same kind of language. You know, if, yeah. if it was all connected together and a whole big group, you know, maybe we might be able to sort of fix things and push for things to be um, a little bit different. Yeah, because but, parents do want their children to be happy and safe. Yeah, of course. That's yeah, and, the bottom and, line of parenting um, mm. and finding a way for our autistic children to feel safe. How do we do mm-hmm. that? Yeah. And um, teaching parents how to accommodate and that mm. accommodations are a good thing and um, figuring out how to make life accessible. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are skills that parents have to learn and there's so much unlearning about traditional parenting uh yeah it's it's a big mountain to climb (laughs) yes it is indeed well um just to kind of um push us through the the, sort of the questions that we have today because we're we're talking today um again about sensory supports environmental adjustments um i suppose the best place to start is why are sensory supports and environmental adjustments important? What do you think I, and in terms of the so child kind of parent side of things? I, it means that your child can access their community. It means that um, they are accessing learning opportunities um, with the spoon theory. Um, we're using their spoons for the right things. If, mm-hmm. if they are in so- sensory overload or even approaching sensory overload, uh, we need to be monitoring the environment and making adjustments so that they have a calm nervous system. And um, it means that they are open to connection and they can access communication. Mm -hmm. Um, It basically just, it makes life possible for them. And it's mental health care. Mm. Yeah. I think I like um in terms of like the the adult side of things. I think you know you could probably say the same just for 
you know, different things like, you know, in, in a workplace, if there's a difficult sensory environment and you're like in an open office plan or you're not allowed to listen to music or put earbuds in and stuff while you're working, um, or even, you know, shades or something to kind of, or reducing the, the light, um, exposure in an office. All of that stuff kind of adds an, an element of, well, it's, it's distracting for one. Um, it's It can cause you a lot of um, stress and sort of burn yeah. out in the long run, um, especially if you're working like a nine to five in an office. Um, and it, it doesn't really allow you space to to do the, the job that you, you need to do. Yeah, or um, to do it well. Or to do it well, exactly. I, I think um, about that with my daughter's accommodations at school. Uh, the accommodations help her to um, be her most successful and and uh, just be able to, I mean, the word perform is <laughs> not the right word, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, to be able to perform at your best and, and um, feel good about what you are producing. Mm-hmm. So I'm hearing a lot of like the well-being side of things but also like the um the productivity side of things because i know that a lot of schools you know their their funding their budgets and stuff they're all determined on what score they get from like ofsted in the uk or some other kind of regulator testing here yep Mm -hmm. and Um, if you're not giving a child a, a break to you know get some proprioceptive input uh, they yeah. are not going to do the test well. <laughs> mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I mean, it's unfortunate that's what the standard is, but, um, you know, we're those accommodations, those sensory breaks are, are so important. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good sort of, of our element to it because, you know, when we, when we think about sensory supports, we think about removing things, but we don't often think about adding things. Which is like just as important. Stims and yeah. as you said, with m- movement breaks and, um, you know, some of the schools that I used to to work with, um, they had these amazing like, I don't know exactly what to call them, but they're kind of this. It's like a a, a piece of e- equipment, park equipment outside, where you have like a bar that you can hold on, and then there's like two swigging um, arms for like your legs that you can just kind of oh, you yeah, can yeah. rock back and forth as a two two legs or you can you can do side side kind of like side. an elliptical machine yeah. yeah yeah sort of like that um <laughs> and all the other teachers used to laugh at me because i used to um i used to um go on it as well like during my breaks and just just go and on it and I, that should be at every school I and mean, i feel that <laughs> way i just with that person particular piece of equipment that you're describing that's vestibular and proprioceptive input which is mm-hmm. so regulating uh, in my daughter's classroom she and I built a calm down corner and oh nice I uh, I put a sheet over a desk to reduce that visual input and put some stem toys in there mm-hmm. or tools I should say uh, and she has access to her noise canceling headphones like all of those are so important um that's brilliant. And the, the accommodations are sometimes is it on the parent side of things. I can feel like I, you know, am I, does she really need these things? But yeah. uh, the truth is she does. And in order for her to be regulated, uh, she needs those things. And for my son, um, he has, he's has very strong sensory needs uh, mm. between taking things away and adding the right things back in, uh, it's a science making yes, sure that, yeah. um, his needs are being supported. So important. And I think, I think like a lot of people though, you know, if you were to kind of present that to schools or to parents, they would say like, well, how are they going to cope in the real world when there's noises and there's lights <laughs> and there's all of this stuff? I'm like, you do know that you can have sensory supports out and about. <laughs> like, absolutely. Absolutely. In and that's, as well. Like, I think that that's what's so important about promoting um, these safe practices and teaching parents is because then you have potentially we could have a whole generation of children who grow up with compassion and who 
care about mental health and who know how to self-advocate uh, for what they need. Uh, mm-hmm. And they will respect somebody else who needs to access those things. And it's, I'm, it makes me excited for the long-term um, payoff of mm. if we can raise a generation of kids who know how to advocate for their needs, um, it, it would be a much better, <laughs> a much better culture. Hey, up. Just popping on to say thank you for listening to this podcast this far. If you could do me a real solid, please make sure to rate the podcast if you're on a podcasting streaming service and do all that like, subscribe, comment stuff on YouTube. Damn, even send a heart in the comments if you don't feel like typing. Make sure to check out my link tree, which is always down below in the description, or head over to my Instagram page at Thomas Henley UK for daily blogs, podcast updates, and weekly lives. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite noise cancelling, noise reducing earbuds that you can adjust the volume on. Really, really great thing. They're called D Buds, and you can find the affiliate link down in the description of this podcast for a 15% off discount. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. That's all from me. Hmm. And I think that's that's a really important thing that you touch on in terms of self advocacy because it's often sort of due to the nature of of autism being autistic and kind of not really fitting fitting in per se and perhaps struggling a bit in in terms of communication. Um, that can be really really tough. I mean, it's tough for any any child or well, any adult as well um, sometimes to advocate for your own needs. Um, when there's this kind of no- set of normative rules that you have to yeah. apply to. And, you know, each time you deviate from that normative role, people kind of point it out and say, get get back in line and do, do this. You've been masking for yeah. your whole life and you start to unmask. And uh, that <laughs> that's a whole conversation <laughs> too. <laughs> but I, um, if, you can, if you can support kids to where they don't have to mask, or um, you teach them, you know, I know that there's a whole uh, demographic of people who teach their children how to mask when it's necessary. Um, Mm -hmm. And, but for me, I think it's, I mean, the bottom line in our home is I want everybody to feel safe with not masking. And if we can, um, move with compassion and feel positive about accommodations, then uh, we're, we're helping each other to have calm nervous systems and Mm -hmm. be able to um, be open to connection. And I, I think as well, it's worth touching on the point that, you know, autistic people, we do have, different sensory systems some things are hypersensitive some things are hyposensitive yeah insensitive or oversensitive um and the but the thing is is that sensory things affect everybody um yes they just affect everybody at different levels yeah and it's it's quite interesting talking to neurotypicals about things like stimming because you know, there's that there's different categories of stimming. You know, I talked to OTNL about sort of um the sensory worlds and stimming and stuff. Um and there's like there's like little stems and there's like those things that everyone does, like rubbing their hands or like tapping their Trying leg. Their hair. Yeah. Yeah, or or having a snack or having a drink or you know, there's there's so many things that people do in their life, whether they're autistic or not, that are regulating in terms of sensory yes. it's just when you when you're autistic it's a bit different and your sensory needs are kind of some of them are a lot more you know you need a lot more input and so yeah. we get these kind of big stims like rocking and spinning and um, and the sensory joy or the autistic joy that comes from some stimming as well mm-hmm. uh, that's a, a really interesting thing that like differs from neurotypical people and oh I yeah know, like I, I was <laughs> I was I was at this presentation um in Birmingham it's called the emotional 
uh, dis dysregulation um, something uh, uh, association maybe <laughs> EDA um, and it was kind of it was funded by the the Commonwealth Games which is it was a really cool opportunity to kind of go and speak I did like a talk about like alexithymia and there was this um, uh, dancer called Kaya who does this who does like aerial based like movements and stuff um and they brought this uh hoop this like structure with like sand my daughter and wants stuff to try and, that <laughs> like a like a string with like a hoop on yeah um that's so cool and after i after i did my presentation i was just i just went to kai and i was like you know can, can, can i have a go on this um <laughs> <laughs> and she's like yeah sure um and then I, I just sat on it and she was like, show me different techniques and stuff. And then uh, at the end, she like spun me around like multiple times. It's like really, really fast to miss the look really funny for, you know, a six foot guy, six foot three guy. It just, oh, it was amazing. <laughs> and it, I, I, it's the same with like roller coasters and theme parks yeah. and stuff. There is just no comparison to the amount of euphoria that I feel yeah. from spinning and like moving and rocking and yeah. it's like i i will never forget um snorkeling in maui and like snorkeling with fish and turtles and coral mm. and just like that was the ultimate experience like sensory experience for me and um yeah. you got like I will the, never the forget noise that. being doubled yeah. by the water it and was you, incredible you see all the, the light <laughs> and the yeah Wow! I, 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 there was no getting me out of the water. <laughs> I, 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 actually, can... I saw a, tur a turtle for the first time in the wild um, in Turkey. It was it was really cool. We thought it was a rock. We're kind of on these like pedal boats. Um, God, they're horrible to to use. But we're on these pedal boats in this like massive lake and stuff. And there was these there was this like sort of thing just poking up and we were like is that a turtle or is that a rock because we know that turtles are around here um and it was a turtle and uh we basically just followed it around for about an hour that's awesome we weren't getting too we weren't getting too close and like distressing it or anything but yeah um yeah, they could bite or, you. or touching it um yeah but yeah we were just kind of i was just kind of observing it, it was really cool <laughs> um i love stuff like that i like i mean we, we could talk about the 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 morals and stuff yeah. implications for yeah. aquatics places with like you, green spaces and, and nature yeah that's um, that's a big part I of our a, life i love aquariums but i'm also very aware that they use excessive amounts of valium on a lot of their <laughs> creatures <laughs> so I, I tend not to go anywhere <laughs> no you should look into it it's, it's a bit bit insane what they do um my new special interest <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um so so we kind of have an idea of why they're important and we know that for a fact you know it doesn't matter if the world has other sensory things that are gonna occur you can always have your sensory aids aids with you um it's something yeah, it's so that important. i do something that yeah, i do as an autistic adult we don't leave the house without the headphones um sunglasses we actually i just got my son some new uh lenses it's called fl41 lens FL41. and it's kind of like a rose colored lens and it does uh it eliminate certain wavelengths of light and it had his uh neurologist and ophthalmologist both recommended it and it has alleviated his migraines uh, uh. he doesn't need pain medication anymore uh, cause he's wearing them, which is really interesting. Um, so I, I, the, I have some, some, some blue light glasses. I actually got them because it's different I from blue work. light. Like the, the computer blue light glasses, it, it's different from that, but the, um, I think it just, it shows the value of these tools and mm -hmm. that it's alleviating pain. And if yep. you can look at uh, sensory overwhelm as a painful experience, uh, that can like help parents to register uh, that our kids aren't just being dramatic or yeah, picky eaters. 
They are mm-hmm. genuinely um, experiencing life in a different way and in distress. So mm-hmm. um, looking for ways to alleviate pain uh, that comes yeah. from sensory. Uh, we have lots of different ways that we accommodate his needs. Uh, when we drive, we, the heater does not get turned on. The radio doesn't get t- turned on. We're really conscientious of when we roll the windows down. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I also have taught him scripts for advocating for his needs. He's really sensitive to people talking. And yeah. um, I... I'm sensitive to my own voice. I realized <laughs> this. Recently, I realized it um, because I, I, I have these... Um, I just kind of insert this. I have like this collaboration affiliate thing going with this company called D Buds. Um, it's D D B. Nice. They have these like adjustable noise canceling earbuds that I really like, and I realized from wearing them, like even on like the low setting of like minus twelve decibels, it was like um, my voice would get louder, mm. um, just naturally to a point where most people would consider it to be like a normal volume. Whereas when I don't have them in, um, I'm very quiet. I'm very soft spoken. And it's because me speaking like too loud actually causes me distress. <laughs> like, yeah. Like well, and there, my own that voice. That makes sense to me. Um, there are certain voices my son does not deal well with. Uh, mm-hmm. And just kind of conversations in general. Um, and kind of a side note, it's so important that we're not talking about our kids in front of them. This isn't like sensory based, but on oh, the yeah. conversation yeah. Um, topic or anyone, it, anyone in front of them. Yes. Just, we don't talk you know, about people like they are not in the room. Uh, <laughs> that's it's just that a really important with, thing with my, with my grandma who she, she has uh, Alzheimer's and I always get really frustrated when like, um, like the staff come over to talk about her in front, in front of us. Front I'm of like, her, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's it just doesn't feel right, you know. Yeah, it's that's that's one of those parenting things that you that pe- parents need to learn immediately, uh, mm. not years later. Um, the kids <laughs> don't. They, they they don't they don't clock that the kids are actually listening in yeah, and what and they're the saying. Doctors, like the doctors should know at this point, uh, yeah. the therapist, uh, that if we're rehashing all of the crises since the last appointment and the child is yeah. sitting there listening to all of their, uh, everything. <laughs> it is, yeah. it's not kind. It's, this is not compassionate. This is not affirming. Um, so that's just kind of a, a lesson learned, um, that parents, like we should be telling parents this when the diagnosis yeah. comes, not, um, and it, you know, it even happens in, you know, I was watching that, that, show uh, love on the spectrum and i yeah. even saw that that happen between like the camera crew the interviewers and the parents of this this one guy can't remember what his name is is kind of the the big star of the show but they were talking about him in front in front of them in, yeah. like in front of them i was just like oh my god they they literally it's just inhumane. don't think that they have have the ability yeah. to process what they're saying like yeah. if they're not looking directly at them and they're doing their own thing that they, they don't have ears and yeah. can't like, you know, so it's. Yeah. And it, um, it comes down to the presumed competence. Also, hmm. uh, we need to be honoring our kids and honoring autistic people um, as whole people. Uh, yeah. It's so important. I think it's really great that we're talking about these kind of wider things. Um, I'm just wondering if we can kind of focus in on like the, the sensory aspect of things yes. again. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's great. It's great to hear. Um, I think it's some, some really useful advice that would be helpful to a lot of people. Um, I guess, you know, in, in, we, we've kind of understood why, why it's important to have these adjustments and these sensory supports, but what, supports can an autistic adult or I'll, I'll do the adult part again but um and or um a parent of an autistic child use to reduce sensory things like wh- where would th- where could they start i 
Um, my starting place and what I encourage parents to do as well is do a like assessment of your home. What are, where are the sounds coming from? Where are the smells coming from? And for our home, I keep small kitchen appliances in the garage. So the coffee grinder, the blender, those are in the garage. I close the door behind me to use them. Um, I'm really aware of the cleaners that we use and soaps and detergents, Mm. um, unscented. I, I close the curtains if there's a lot of like bright sunshine or contrasting. Um, I'll try to close the curtains before my son comes in the room, especially in the morning, going from dark to light, that big contrast. Uh, we've replaced fans. So like our bathroom fan, we replaced the, the oh, I motor. Hate those. Yeah. It's the ones it's that really connect to him. the lights when you put yes. the light on as well. Yes. That's, uh, and even in the in the community, we keep track of what bathrooms have fans that <laughs> that come on <laughs> with the light switch, um, and that kind of goes along with the assessment thing of of um, doing your due diligence. Uh, I look for um, soft materials, so mm-hmm. replacing anything that has buttons or zippers or feels scratchy, especially oh, yeah. if you have a person who. Um, experiences self-injurious behaviors, making sure that you're Mm not uh, pulling in a pillow that has buttons and zippers, um, that would be dangerous. So um, you can also look at your uh, decor. (laughs) Uh, Maybe you have too many colors and it's visually too much input. Um, You can look at if the, if your child or the person, autistic person has spatial awareness challenges, you know, can you put some cushions on the corners so that they're not Mm. injuring themselves because their spatial awareness, uh, a lot of it just really is being diligent and assessing the environment. And so you'd say that, that, that kind of, cause I, I would agree with you as well. I think, you know, the best course of action is to remove things at the source. You know, I, you want to remove things before adding in things that could help. Yeah. Because I feel like that's, you know, if you can remove the sources of the stress, it's better than having the sources Putting of the stress, but also having ways to ways yeah. to deal with that stress. You yeah. just want to get rid of it first so there's yep. it's just not, and maybe not a even, stressful environment. Maybe this isn't the time to run the dishwasher. Yeah. You know, the... That for my son, it's hard for him to eat if the dishwasher is running. So I'll just put on pause and really like that. It's not a big deal. Um, yeah. and, you know, and then in terms of adding things back in, uh, we have a swing and when my kids stop using it, I know it's time to put a different swing attachment up. And, yeah. um, for my daughter, I use the TheraPressure brush or lotion and, um, we What's talk, that? a TheraPressure brush, um, they call it the Wilberger protocol, but we don't follow it exactly, but it's kind of like a little silicone bristles. It's, uh, that fold easily and it gives some good proprioceptive input. You just do long strokes like on the arms, legs or the back. Uh, mm. and she actually will take it with her to school in her pocket and just use it on the palms of her hands. Um, uh. And it, I might need to get of, one of those. It's pretty cool. Um, and it's it just gives some nice deep pressure. Uh, and it was actually, it was a, two different occupational therapists have recommended it um, at different, mm. one for my son and one for my daughter at different times for different purposes. Uh, but she really seeks that out and um, lotion for her as well. If she comes home dysregulated, that's kind of one of the first tools. I'll be like, okay, let me, let's do like a little lotion on your arms and uh, co-regulate. But uh, removing sensory input and then pulling in the right sensory input is is so important. We use a lot of uh, cool lights. Um, Mm -hmm. So the, you know, like the galaxy projector lights, that has yeah, been really yeah. successful oh, I in love our those home. Things. 
That's I mean, been really I've, fun. I pulled this out on on the OTNL podcast. Oh my god, I haven't put my flashy thing on in the background <laughs> like usual. Oh, it's not it's not connected. <laughs> <laughs> I've got well I've got I've got this. I'll put it on in a sec, but I've got this yeah, fiber optic cool. light, which I really love. Uh, I also had this this jellyfish light as well, but cool. I just haven't I haven't put the batteries in in a while and I need to get on that because it is like if I'm like working and I'm just like I need to have a little bit of a break, I can just yeah. sort of stare at the jellyfish, listen to yeah. my music. I think that that's really important. Um, I know the focus is autism, but with ADHD and cause they, you know, co-occurring so frequently, uh, adding in that, um, that hit of dopamine, <laughs> um, with the cool lights or the music to stim to, um, uh, sometimes we'll do like a piece of gum or a piece of candy just to get, uh, get us motivated. Um, you know, the body doubling, there's so many, um, tools. And when you look at it like Mm -hmm. tools, uh, it helps us to, to cope and, and be the person that we want to be like, nobody wants to be dysregulated. Um, Mm -hmm. so if you're looking at sensory input like that, it, it makes sense. Yeah. I think from, um, from the kind of the the autistic adult side, I think, you know, a lot of those things could definitely be transferable. Um, you know, whether you're a, a child or an adult, you can use stuff like that. It's like, I recently did a post on oral motor needs and a lot of people didn't even know what they were and, and that they had them. Um, and a lot of people like bite their lips and like, you know, grind their teeth or, you know, snack a lot that was a big one for me um i just wasn't getting that that oral motor stimulation so you know things like chewing things is quite a big thing yeah we have Um, a collection of of chewy chew necklaces (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) where you can do like carrots and schools from my from what i've heard they're not the most like they're not the most um accommodating for that like um you know, they they're make, like, oh no, that's a child thing. Like, you know, yeah. you know. My daughter has heard so many uh, rude comments about her chew necklaces, um, so many times. It's terrible. Yeah, and trying to to teach her um, how to advocate for why she mm-hmm. needs it. That it, she no, she's not teething, and no, she's not a baby. This is not a baby teething necklace. Like, it helps her. Um, with sensory input and combat anxiety, uh, there's the the advocating is relentless. But that's yeah, what I it's so imagine. important to teach our kids to advocate for themselves. Because mm-hmm. um, you're not always around them, especially if they go to yes. school. Yep. You know, and it's hard, isn't it? Um, it is hard. It's you know, in 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 terms of like sensory support for adults, I'd say, you know common things to use would be sunglasses or like what you were saying about those um f f d f d forty one forty one yeah f l forty one nearly got it um the things like those can be helpful i mean my blue light glasses help they actually help more with with calming me than eye strain yeah. but um i find those quite helpful there's also I... things like headphones Earbuds, yeah. ear defenders, yeah. um, the D bud, um, earplugs. Yeah, I, I use loops. <laughs> to reduce sensory They're probably noise. similar. Yeah, and uh, also things, uh, sensory toys. You know, yeah. it could be things like um, acupressure rings, which I really like. Uh, that you can just put on your finger. You can keep it in your pocket. They're just things that you can just roll up and down your your finger, and it's quite. So proprioceptive in that sense. Um, there's also uh, compression clothes, which I actually utilized a lot when I was a teenager. Um, like, you know, you get those compression clothes for like sports and stuff. Um, I find that a lot of my anxiety comes in through my legs. Like it's the first place that that really starts to become an issue um, when, it, when I get anxious or, or overloaded. So 
I used to wear um, compression bottoms like under my my school clothes. Um, that really helped. Um, for a lot of people, I think sometimes <laughs> sometimes people like tight clothing. Sometimes people like loose clothing. And I'm definitely on the I like the tight clothing side of things. But um, I mean, it could be just some something simple like opting for wearing some stylish joggers, um, some trainers that kind of look a bit bit more formal, um, even you know soft softer hoodies, hats. Yeah. You know, there there could be a lot of things that you could you could use sort of on a daily basis. Hats um, and hoodies and even, are are one of my staples. Mm-hmm. Just, and even at home, you know, yeah. uh, utilize any flaws that you have to lay on them if you're feeling stressed. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. It's like I come home from a speaking event or a hard day, and I'll just lay on the the living room floor and chat to my mum about like uh, my day and stuff, and that really helps doing like stretches and things like yeah, that. Stretching. Um, a lot of people find weighted blankets or weighted uh, toys, plushies, quite helpful for them. Um, it's not something that I like, so I, I feel a bit restricted. I like to move around a lot. Um, but I, I've heard that it can be quite helpful for some people. There's this company called Fidget Gem. Uh, Fidget, no, Fidget Gem. I'm combining company names. Fidget <laughs> Bum. I don't know if they're still going on, but I, I used to chat to their sort of company founder, and they, they do these... It's kind of like a, a, a sock for your mattress. Um, and it provides the pressure through like the tension of the elastic material rather than oh, nice. the weight of weight of the blanket. Um and you can sort of move around in it and you can like adjust the tightness of it and stuff. And that 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 has been really helpful for me. I still don't know if they do stuff like that, but it might be worth having a look at that kind of thing. Um I think the issue was with it is that yeah. The, the actual product, it, it worked really well, but the problem was um, it kind of looks a bit restrictive mm. and they, they didn't know whether it would kind of get past health checks and stuff because, you know, it is like a basically you kind of binding, in the bed. binding yeah. yourself to the bed a little bit. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that could be problematic. Are, yeah, yeah, but exactly. I, but I see the intention. My husband definitely, um, he likes the sheets to be super tight. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of like a, a body sock that is used <laughs> for that proprioceptive input. Um, I can see... Like, like what like Russian children get, where they get like swaddled after they get... Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I like swaddling for babies. Like that's a common practice. Um, yeah. And from the sensory perspective... Like now we can see like why do babies love to be swaddled? Yeah, yeah. It's not just the the feeling of being in the womb, it's that deep pressure. Mm, and mm. that need doesn't just vanish because mm. they turn into a toddler. Um I mean I'd I'd quite like to go through perhaps some of the things that I use. Um I mean just just for examples, just things that I have about fidget cubes, different things that you can push and click and fiddle with if you if you're feeling like you need to do some for your hands there's the typical uh fidget spinners of course i've gone for a very gothic style school fidget spinner <laughs> i got from thailand um and there's also this if i can i find um like massage and deep pressure and vibration really helpful so i have this sort of uh this foot massager that i have under my desk that i can nice put my foot on and it it just vibrates and it's got like these rolly things that you can sort of use just having that under my desk yeah sure it kind of resonates throughout the house a little bit but <laughs> but if it helps you Which, complete the task yeah then that's good or, or simply having a blanket that i can just mm-hmm. kind of put over myself and just you know just stuff like that Little things like that, it, it kind of, it adds up. Um, it does. And especially if you you struggle, like, focusing and stuff, just having different things that you can do to kind of modify your sensory environment on the daily is quite, it's quite useful. Um, yeah. And then is lastly, hard- there's noise-canceling headphones, of course, and music. Yeah. That's a big one. I think it's important just to note that 
uh, if you are assessing um, somebody else's sensory needs, like as mm-hmm. a parent, um, that it's not going to be the exact same every day. And sure. just recognizing that um, maybe yesterday they needed to spin, but today they need uh, to run. Like just mm-hmm. recognizing that it's not like they talk a lot about sensory diet. And I think that that's something that is important to be added to the conversation is that, um, and maybe their capacity for it changes day to day. Uh, what mm-hmm. they could tolerate yesterday is intolerable today. Uh, oh, totally. It, it's just so just important like to recognize that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the compiling effect of mm-hmm. um, appointments and demands placed yeah. upon them. Uh, just recognizing that, that it's not the same every day. Sure. Um, I know we've, we've talked a lot. I think we've, we've kind of touched on the third question, um, sort of about in terms of like adjustments in the home. Um, I mean, I, I, I could go through some of the things that have been quite useful for me. Um, dimmer switches, obvious big, big one. Um, just being able to reduce the intensity of lights that you have. That's a really, really important thing. Um, I actually, I have this, one of those bulbs, those light changing bulbs that you can can like connect to Alexa, got it for like 20 quid, just replace my old bulb. Um, and I can, I can ask Alexa to like, put it to like 5%, 10%, 20, 30, 40, you know? Um, and that really helps, but I can also, because it's a color changing one, I can also adjust the light. So sometimes, you know, in the morning, if I want to get up, then I will ask Alexa to turn on the light blue, um, to kind of mimic that, that kind of waking cycle thing. And then at nighttime, I'll have it to set, set, um, to orange to like really, really dark orange to kind of reduce the the blue light. Um, and I find that really helpful and is especially paying dividends to the fact that a lot of people struggle with agor- agoraphobia mm-hmm. or going outside and you spend, tend to be more likely to spend a lot of time isolated indoors. Um, just having those, like that ability to adjust some light or adjust your environment in little ways throughout the day. It, it's really good for your mental health. Like, yeah, I agree. Um, it, you know, I could I could probably say that the the same thing could be said for my use of music. Uh, anytime that I do podcasts, anytime that I speak, um, I'm always listening to music, um, which is it's kind of like that that thing that I can sort of tie into. You know, you people talk about uh, having a space to work and having a space to rest. Well, that's how I kind of get around it, and you know, um, it's just my environment. I think. As well, uh, opting for carpets rather than floors, just because of the coldness on your feet, um, and also the echoes and stuff. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Also, mm-hmm. um, I know that there's this really strange dynamic because I'm not very good at keeping tidy and clean, but I also really hate clutter. So there's also a bit of um, effort from my part to kind of. Make sure that things are clean and and there's not too much clutter everywhere because it definitely does have an impact on my mental health um, positively when it's not cluttered, uh, negatively when it is. Um, Me too. (laughs) (laughs) I think uh, switching out bulbs and appliances that have that electrical hum. Yeah. um, Clocks and and TikTok. Clocks at TikTok, yeah, definitely. That's a big one. Um, can't stand those things. <laughs> uh, what else? Um, I think another thing that people overlook a lot is uh, heaters and generators. Yes. Like, where is it in the house, and is there any like noise reducing yeah. material we've, for that? We've actually put up the noise canceling foam panels, like what they would use in a music studio. Yeah. yeah, We put that on the interior of the door that houses um, our furnace on, well, there's two doors and we put up on both sides and it did just kind of reduce a bit of the, the sound. It didn't cancel it entirely, but 
um, it helped. And yeah. And I, cause my son is, you know, keenly aware of the, the sound and um, mm-hmm. we talk about the thermostat. I think that transparency about why it's coming on and when to anticipate it, teaching the skill of, um, you know, how to like rationalize why things are the way they are and why this sensory thing is happening. Mm-hmm. I think as as well, definitely because, you know, in a perfect world, we'd be able to control our sensory environment to a T, yeah. but it's not always possible. Sometimes you have neighbors, sometimes you have, yes. you know, you're in flats and there's people next to you next, next door and you, you can't always control that. Um, I think having things that are quite calming for you, um, like uh, like a desk fan, something that produces noise, white, like white noise or something, um, or even just just using sensory supports like headphones or earphones um, to manage environments where you, where you don't have that control. Um, I think it's really important, and especially for me, like the thinking of the stims that I have. Uh, wind in my face you know every time i go in a car every time that i can i'll roll down the window like stick my head out the window they like have the the tongue flapping like scooby-doo like that's my thing. daughter <laughs> <laughs> um i love that so i i pretty much always when i'm trying to relax i'll, I'll stick my fan on because it, it does produce that sort of background noise um that i can tolerate and that i like and it also has that like wind element. I've heard a lot of people use that for sleep, which is it's interesting. Um, you have like to be careful with that, though. The, the temperature, temperature mm. of the home, um, and That's even a good thing. you know, like the the cool air, warm blanket yep. ratio. Um, should, it's another thing to to be aware of that um, that sensory experience. Yeah, because we're not always aware of stuff like that either. Yeah. Um, temperature changes and stuff. Because the the way that I can tell when I'm cold is when I start shivering. Yeah. And the way that I can tell when I'm hot is when I start sweating. Yep. And uh, finding the middle ground in between that is sometimes quite hard. It's like that interoceptive kind of element yes. to it. Yeah, and and the weather again is something we can't control, and mm. the wind like you were oh, mentioning yeah. or like the raindrops on your skin uh, the sound of thunder those we now check the weather report every day uh, to help my son anticipate what kind of weather are we going to have today and if thunder and lightning is in the forecast you know we take a lot of uh, measures to help him feel comfortable and if that means um, headphones or making his space extra cozy and Mm -hmm. sitting close to each other so he can co-regulate. Just really not discounting um, the impact that uh, that sensory has on a person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Well, um, I guess like, you know, a natural follow-on from sort of monitoring home environments would be, you know, in an ideal world, <laughs> um, or perhaps a world where your managers or people around you might listen to, you know, listen to you about sensory sensory related things. Um, what kind of workplace or public space um, adjustments do you think would be really helpful? Um, you know, accessing the community is a human right. Um, and of course on my side as the parent, I, I'm keeping note of what places offer sensory accommodations. Um, I, when my son hospitals are the worst. Oh (laughs) yeah. Oh man. Hospitals are rough. Um, but even like a movie theater offering a sensory time or a coffee shop, making it family friendly, um, grocery stores could offer sensory t- hours. Um, playgrounds should be enforcing dogs on leashes. Uh, any place, any community and space could be replacing their light bulbs 
um, to take the fluorescent light bulbs out. Mm. Uh, last week I actually called a restaurant. My son was open to going into a restaurant, having lunch, and we make sure that we go right when they open for lunchtime. So it's not busy. Um, yeah. But I actually called ahead of time to ask to place our order so that it would be ready when we walked in. He wouldn't have to sit and wait. Um, and they told me no. And I was a bit shocked <laughs> that like such an easy accommodation. They said, no, you can order from your table. And it just kind of makes it clear how much work there is to do still. Um, and, but these are opportunities for, uh, businesses to, um, be more inclusive. And it's something that, that I would like to, uh, it's on my like goal list is to figure out how to help the, uh, community spaces be more inclusive and accommodating, um, for disabled people, for autistic people. I actually, I find it very, it's very interesting because a lot of the time when, because I, I have sort of some links into that that world of doing actu- like sensory adjustments for, um, like I I did one as part of my part time job at um, a company called NDTI uh, organization charity, um, and they have a section of the business which does sensory reviews of like, um like housing uh spaces for pe- people with disabilities um they also go into workplaces and do assessments and they you know they did they, they do all these kind of things they have like a team of autistic people <laughs> who go in and uh basically just check and test and um you know look at look at all the the sensory aspects that could be improved and um, and also I, I was part of a project, um, at this, this children's hospital called Alderhey, Alderhey hospital, um, in the UK. Um, you know, obviously the hospital, the hospital is the place that I think of the most when I think of the downs, the, the really negative side of not managing sensory environments because the hospital is supposed to be a place that you go to when you need help, when your health is in 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 difficulty and a lot of autistic people will actually put off yeah. getting help for stuff because they know that they're going to have to go into a hospital yep um you've got those aspects of the fluorescent lights the reflective floors the 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 scented cleaning yes. products the coffee lounges the the busy waiting rooms the with no opportunity to, the beeping machines um other people there's in so distress. Many, mm, yeah. There's there's so many aspects to to that environment. I mean, not not even talking about, you know, getting shots and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not even like um, the heavy stuff. Like yeah, it's heavy. Yeah. Just being in the presence of a hospital is is mm. a lot to deal with, let alone if you are having a medical procedure. And that's that's a really big issue because if we kind of if you if you instill that these ho- these hospitals are a negative place at a young age, or, or even places like the dentist or the haircut, the hairdressers, um, being being others. That can, that can really impact someone's ability to, you know, get their Access teeth healthcare. sorted out. Yeah. Access healthcare. Get get their their, their it's, haircut it's and causing trauma. For, exactly. Um, so we we did a lot of adjustments there. Uh, there was a lot of talk about, you know, monitoring the contrast, um, providing sensory safe spaces, uh, of course, adjusting the lights, um, offer, offering sensory supports to be used, um, you know, for situations where you can't control the noise due to the amount of people there. Um, just little things like that. We kind of we kind of did some some like sensory training to like make some of the um, hospital staff more aware of these these things and and be a bit more proactive in um, talking to the young people about the changes that they're making and stuff. Um, just little things like that, I think, can be can be really really useful um, yeah. in in those public public settings. 
and and quite often they're not very expensive or they're very cheap. They're just it's just adjustments. Yeah, it, you just need someone to go in and be accountable and actually do the 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 damn work, um, which is often the the hardest thing about any any workplaces or <laughs> institutions yeah. or organizations, uh, public spaces. It's getting someone to actually just go in and do it. Or yeah. just commission someone to do it. It's just so complex. And it is complex. And I like how you said it's about being proactive. We don't need to just do a band-aid fix. Uh we're not treating the outside external behavior, but we're actually um looking at making the environment safe. Mm. Well, um, I think that's that's what I'd think. I mean I kind of ha- I have in my head. I mean, it's you know, it's it's never going to be f- a foolproof way to just go up to your managers and say, "Can you do some sensory improvement work in the office? Um, can I not work in an open space office? Can I wear my earbuds? Can I listen to music? Can I put um, sunglasses on?" Um, and it's it's a very complex because I know a lot of people don't disclose that they're autistic, um, so that's like an added added complexity I, I i'm not really sure about how to kind of fix that aspect of things but i would i would definitely point to point you to to sending to to your manager or sending to an organization someone that you perhaps trust to sort of help you in that if, if you can if you have someone like that uh, there's the it's not rocket science report by ndti um, and that's a pretty pretty comprehensive kind of look at the types of issues, sensory issues within the workplace and what can be done. And the interesting thing that you'll find is that these sensory adjustments help everybody. As yes. I said, at the start, everybody has sensory needs and things that they don't like. And it's not necessarily always an autism thing. You can you can have sensory processing differences and not be autistic. And it's, you know, it's very highly tied together, but it's not always the case. And even for people who don't have those processing differences, uh, making those sensory adjustments will impact everybody positively. Yes. Improve the work environment. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I think this, we've had sort of a really practical and, and theoretical sort of discussion about like the different aspects of the sensory things. I think uh, there's one thing that I kind of wanted to... Um, to add in um just just for people's knowledge before we kind of try to uh, round up and end the, end the podcast um i think it's it's really important to understand the the terms uh sensory seeking and sensory avoidant because they, these things are or, or or even even adding into that uh, sensory defensiveness um because as we know senses are not they're not so clean cut and like someone's hypersensitive so they hate all light not true they might love certain lights yeah and they might love certain lights only when they can control that said light um so th- th- there's always an aspect of individualization for each thing is it's not so easy as saying oh the hypersensitive to that hyposensitive to that and just kind of listing things off it's very individual to the person um whilst i hate background noise and people talking i love listening to heavy metal and rap and just really loud angry high energy music um and that's just that's just one of the examples you know i hate white lights but i love bright flashing disco lights and things like that they're just absolutely i absolutely love them um so there's the sensory seeking which is obviously seeking out that thing and it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to hyper or hyposensitivities Uh, it tends to be you tend to seek out stuff if you're hyposensitive to it but it's not always the case um stimming tends to be for things that you're hypersensitive to as well sensory joy tends to come in with those hypersensitivities um not always but that's just just a kind of a trend that i've noticed um, and also sensory avoidant, which I suppose is kind of the most important in terms of reducing sensory distress. Um, 
And uh, I think the last last thing that I said was sensory defensiveness, and that's like what I was saying about control over sensory environments. Um, if if there's an element of control involved by the person, by the child, by the by the adult um, over that sensory environment, sometimes they, they they can tolerate very 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 strong sensory input, but as long as they can control it, they're fine with it. Um, the issue is is when it's kind of thrust upon you. It's like I, I always give the example of, you know, I love hugs, but if you come up to me and just give me a hug out of the blue um i'm probably gonna pull away and just be a bit yeah. like oh or you put your hand on my shoulder i'm like oh okay it's um, like autonomy yeah and it's having control over it because you know being prepared for things is is important as well um but yeah i think that's all i had to say have, have you got anything else that you'd like to sort of add on before we um i mean with Go the to song of the day sensory seeker and sensory avoider i think it's important to note that you can be both uh, a seeker at the same time yeah, yeah. a seeker yeah. on you know visual input or spicy foods but also avoidant of background noises and um hugs like the yeah. you can absolutely be both and recognizing in our kids uh what they seek and what they avoid and finding ways to honor it Brilliant. Well, um, it's been really great talking to you, Natasha. Just wondering, do you have, have you remembered about the the song of the day, or did, did I forget I to ask you? I did it? remember. Nope, you oh, told you me did. about okay, it. Cool. Yes, and <laughs> I I did have to kind of think about it. Did I want to do like a song that I like, or do I want to so do a song that has some depth? And of course, I had to go for the depth. Um, okay. And I went I went for um, "Show Yourself" from Frozen Two by Idina Mendez, 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 no, but yeah, show but yourself it, from Frozen 2, Menzel, okay, <laughs> and I shared it with my sister when she was going through um, her aut autism diagnosis, and I feel like it is such a perfect representation of um, late diagnosed autistic female, especially um, learning how to unmask and who am I without the mask. Uh, I think the, even the video from the movie is, is really powerful, but um, I think Frozen 2 in, in, in its entirety has a lot of uh, uh, implication for yeah. the autistic woman late diagnosed woman um it's definitely it's definitely popular with a lot of autistic kids <laughs> yeah well and um, um show yourself was at the beginning of the movie and that's like where she begins to unmask and then or no no sorry yeah. the other one well anyway <laughs> um yeah it's not i'm gonna say it's not my special interest but um I, well, Frozen's I, I not my special it. interest either, but um, <laughs> I've seen it because I have a daughter, and um, yeah. but the the experience of of being female and learning how to unmask, mm. I think, um, show yourself sure. is a great representation of that. Thank you. Well, I will add that to the Forty Forty Song of the Day playlist, which is always down in the description. So, if you have enjoyed this episode. Um, please make sure to rate it if you're on Spotify, Apple, Google, all of that stuff. And if you're watching over on YouTube, please make sure to give it a like and a subscribe. Comment down below a blue heart or a heart of any kind if you don't feel like writing a long comment because that will do absolute wonders for me getting this podcast out from, to more people. Um, and it would re I would really appreciate it. I, I'm kind of in the process of setting up my business and I've, and I've been talking f about it for a while. Um, I realized that it's April now and I said that it would be around April that I get my stuff sorted out and everything. But there's there's been a lot of um, changes within my own life um, in terms of work and my advocacy work and um, setting up the different aspects of my business. So I'm not sure how, how long that's going to take to really set up. Um, I am also switching from, from doing a more of a coach coaching role to a consultancy role and basically all that means is that i won't be coaching people through a process and i will be actually able to talk to people one-to-one -one and give my opinions as an autistic adult 
which I feel like provides me a lot more um, ability to speak freely without, in, you know, have it, having to be careful about what you say and, you know, perhaps um, having more of an approach of guiding people, you know. I, I, I feel like I feel like consultancy probably fits me a lot better. Um, so it's it's basically going to be the same thing. It's just without all the annoying formalities, um, forms, things like that. Um, and yeah, if you if you do en- enjoy the podcast, please head over to my Instagram at Thomas Henley UK. Um, and I'm realizing that this Frozen song is becoming very loud, so I'm just going to turn that down. <laughs> I'm listening to it now um, in the background. It's it's getting a bit too. Yeah. Last thing, what was I going to say? Yeah, Instagram. Um, you can find updates uh, about the podcast and the other stuff that I do, uh, as well as um, fully comprehensive blogs every day of the week where, where you can uh, learn about different aspects of autism, whether you're autistic or not, um, whether you're a parent or whether you're an autistic adult. Um, always really great stuff to to learn from, and it's it's free. Um, so p- please head over there, give it a follow, uh, check out my stuff. Uh, this podcast is sort of loosely sponsored by DBuds, which I did sort of allude to earlier. Um, if you want to go check out them below, I'll put a link to, uh, my affiliate link. Um, I'll get a small commission from that and you get about a 15% discount on them. Really love them. Really, really encourage anyone to kind of check it out, have a look at them. Um, they've been amazing for me sort of around about at the gym, especially when I'm going to the gym with my dad and I don't have my music on. It's, it can be really important for, for reducing that background noise. So yeah, uh, Natasha, where can people find you? Where would you like people to go? I am mainly on Instagram. It's at, I want to tell you books and, um, I, I focus on that platform. Cool. Well, I will put that um, down in the description as per usual. Last question, Natasha. Have you enjoyed your 40 Orty experience? So much. Thank you for having me. Um, it's it's a treat for me to be here. Yeah. And you, well, that sounded very abrupt. What am I talking about? Um, <laughs> I'm getting a bit loopy. I, 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 haven't, <laughs> I haven't eaten much today. I'm like, my brain's, my brain's running, running a bit. Um, Oh my god! <laughs> I loved being here. I'm, I'm Good. such an honor. I'm glad. I, I'm glad. I, the, the guests that you have had on your podcast are people that I I admire and I respect so much. Um, and so to be part of that group is is very special to me. You you're a very good speaker. I will tell you that you you do have a talent for speaking. If so. I get very very nervous. <laughs> well, you did amazing. Um, you did really well. Uh, I I would definitely encourage you to get more involved in whether it's like videos or podcasts or more interviews because you, <sighs> you've got the knack for it. I would say. Thanks. It it terrifies me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for watching or listening to the 40 Audio podcast. Um, really lovely to have you uh, on today, listening to us, chat everything about autism, sensory experiences, sensory support, sensory aids, whatever you want to call them, um, and more or less making your life a little bit easier and uh, less sensory overloading and uh, less anxiety provoking. Uh, I hope that you've been able to take something from this podcast, whether you are a parent or an autistic adult like myself. Um, And yeah, uh, I will see you in another episode of the 4040 podcast next week. See you later, guys.